a gang of boys decides to seek adventure and fun down at the local lake. But does it have more in store for them than they at first realize? A young girl is seeking therapy for the bad dreams that she seems to have every night. But will it help the dreams end? So go the two stories that I have for you this evening, both from Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit that I set up so I could read to you the stories that you sent to me. Now, my dear friends, it's been a long, hard week, and I think you deserve to sit back and relax with your favorite drink. But not before I share with you a little game that I've been playing online, something I've been having a lot of fun with, and I think that you'll enjoy too. Your main task, to stay alive in a world that's occupied by zombies. Why do I like this game? Well, it's an extremely well-developed storyline that perfectly sets up a post-apocalyptic world where you have to survive against zombies and battle other players in real-time player versus player. The graphics are also amazing. Highly detailed characters and zombies, as well as beautiful animation and cinematic special effects. You can use rifles, grenades, shotguns and anything else to secure safe havens and save survivors. You can build, customize, and defend your camp, not only from zombies, but also rival factions, and attack enemy bases using the unique Chopper game mode. So, what are you waiting for? Download Left to Survive for free via my links below. Use the special promo code and get a special bonus for new players. The boys ran down to the water, laughing and punching, goose fleshed in the cold gold of hollow sunlight. Hopping gingerly like cranes over the sharp flints, they shoved and pulled, dragging and shrieking in the shallows, pale figures splashing through ripped bronze. Their voices clattered through the still afternoon like rowdy gate crashes at a wake, yet to notice the embarrassed silence. <laughs> so the dude says, Jeez, lady. I'm doing it as fast as I can, cackled Russell. You get it? You see, the kid's name is... Yeah, I got it in the first grade, numb nuts, Harry retorted. I think I've got something sticking to... You know, the realization of what had attached itself to him, he dashed out of the water, screaming, It's a leech! It's a goddamn leech! Holy shit! Russell muttered when he lifted his own arm out of the water to find three of the parasites feeding on his bicep. Ah, oh, hell no, Larry yelped upon seeing Harry reach the shore practically covered with the segmented predatory worms. They clambered out of the infested pond with haste, where Harry fished out a half-empty pack of cowboy killers and an orange bick out of the jeans he'd left strewn about haphazardly with the rest of the gang's discarded clothing. I'll lit a cigarette, he said. We can burn them off. They're all over my legs, Russell cried. Yeah, I hate leeches, Bobby growled as he peeled one of the wretched annelids from his forearm. It's okay, assured Harry, passing a lit Marlboro to Bobby. They're coming off. Oh, God. Hurry up, man, Russ whined impatiently. Uh, hey... What's up with Nate? Lenny inquired, staring back at the only member of their party who had not made any attempt to escape the bloodthirsty pests. Hey, Nate, Lenny called out. Get out of the water. It's full of leeches. Nate didn't answer him. He simply remained afloat in a fixed position, motionless, having grown unnaturally pale with dull eyes glazed over, staring at nothing in particular. What's up with him? Bobby asked. Can he hear us? Hey, Nate, Harry tried. Oh, come on, man. Still, Nate did not respond. I think he's having a heart attack or something, Harry concluded. Oh, shit, dude, blurted Lenny. Under the water, I can see something. Oh, shut up. That's just shadows, Bobby objected. We've got to get him out of there, asserted Harry. We can't just leave him. No way, man, 
Russell protested. There's leeches. I can't go back in. Harry, I can see them, Lenny ranted. Under the water. Oh, shut it, Lenny, Bobby squawked. We, we better go and f fetch somebody, Harry stammered as they collected the piles of clothing they had left on the bank. Listen, Nate, we'll be right back, okay? Dark and rich, pumping through their hearts, laced with the silver of stolen adrenaline, they feasted as they saw fit, safe from the desiccating sunlight. Down there, the night went on forever. They were left to weightless twilight, shut out from the killing day. They breathed in stagnant water and breathed out roses. One by one, they detached from the boy's exsanguinated corpse and went down, down into the drowned town. Submerged, the town's mask eroded away to reveal the fascinating skull beneath. A sparkling current of fish threaded itself through a shattered windscreen, and blind things writhed down lightless avenues. The whole place had gone bad around thirty-seven years prior. Something old and thirsty had come flapping down the interstate and settled there. After that, the town grew strangely silent, and whatever happened there happened after dark. Eventually, Someone had cleansed the town by exploding the dam. A thousand-ton wall of iron green. A whole city of water rolling across the fragile dollhouses of Trenton, like judgment. It turned the pale things into bitter dust, and then sliced the dust away. Russ, Bobby, listen, we've got to tell somebody, Harry pleaded. Jesus Christ, dude, what about his folks? No freaking way, man, Russell snapped. We weren't supposed to be swimming out there in the first place. You don't know my pops. He'd crucify me. The cops would do worse, Bobby added. We can't just leave Nate there and not tell anybody, Harry contested. I mean, we took him out there. It's in our hands. Oh, that's bullshit, Russell vociferated. It ain't my fault he wanted to go there. I ain't taking the blame. You want him so bad, you go back for him. I ain't going back, Lenny muttered solemnly. I seen him. They were... Lenny, a perturbed Bobby interrupted. Don't Lenny me. I seen him, under the water. They were drinking him. Bobby's right arm encircled Lenny's neck with the latter's trachea at the crook of the former's elbow. His right hand grasped his own upper left arm, his left hand placed behind Lenny's head. You didn't see shit, Bobby hissed through clenched teeth. You understand me? There wasn't anything there. There weren't no faces, and there weren't no fingers under the water, and... and... He released his grip and allowed a breathless Lenny to go tumbling onto the ground. And anyway, you're all crazy. I'm going home. Yeah. Yeah, me too, murmured Russell, gazing upon a gasping Lenny sheepishly. My pops don't like it if I stay out too late. I can't believe this, Harry expostulated. What about Nakes, folks? We can't just leave him back there, you, you assholes. Oh, he was just acting up, Bobby affirmed extending an apologetic helping hand to Lenny in order to help him back to his feet. Yeah, he was probably just trying to freak us out on purpose. I bet he's back home right now, laughing his ass off. That's where I'm going, Lenny mewled. Home. Hey, come back, Harry demanded to his departing friends. He wasn't acting up. Russ, you saw him. He was white. His lips, his cheeks, they were... All oh, white. His desperate appeal fell on deaf ears as the trio continued toward the path that led to the main road. Okay, fine. You guys can go home and let Mom tuck you into bed. Why not? But I ain't leaving Nate out there. 
You're slime. You know that? You're just slime. Slime decorated her bridal veil. Rotted, artificial flowers clinging to the flesh-eaten gorse. Decomposed and delicate, they carried it to the chambers where she waited for them in the dark. Swollen, naked, white and heavy with roe. Her time had almost come, and she was suffused with terrible beauty. Once, back in the half-life that she endured while living in the drylands, her name was Isabel. She worked in a supermarket and worried about pimples, believing no man would ever want her. But now, the unfulfilled aching was gone, for she wasn't Isabel anymore. She waited, pale and magnificent in the heavy darkness, for the embrace of her first lover. They called her the mother. Too massive to hunt, too cumbersome to feed, she hungered while their veins throbbed with purloined crimson. With nails like pearl switchblades, they opened their palms, letting her drink deep. She was ultimately feeding for many. Behind her, the bridal train hung bent and twisted in the filthy waters. Gently, they guided her out through the lampless passageways, out to meet ecstasy, to meet death, in order to birth a new, unique being. For soon... The dark millennium would fall, and the world would be a different place, requiring a different species. Cataracts would occlude the sun, shutting out its hateful light, and fabulous life forms would flourish and struggle beneath the perpetual stars. Her eyes were heavy and bovine, drugged with blissful maternity. She smiled at her congregation through the clouded waters. From a sea-changed body would come the new generation of their race, begotten in the depths, born in violence, and suckled in darkness. Nate! Nate! It's Harry! I came back for you, like I said! A sudden flutter overhead gave him a start. He turned his attention to the unexpected disturbance, to witness a small bat snatch a moth right out of the cool evening air. Harry let out a sigh of relief, just as he heard the sound of dry leaves and twigs being crushed underfoot, accompanied by a familiar voice. Hello, Harold, the voice greeted. Harry spun around to face the intruder, to see that it was none other than Nate himself. He was still pale and damp, but apparently no worse for wear, and certainly in better condition than Harry had expected. Nate, oh man, Harry cheered. We were so scared. We thought you were dead. He placed a hand on Nate's shoulder and involuntarily recoiled when he found his skin cold and clammy to the touch. Jeez, Nate, you'd better find your clothes. You're freezing. Not yet, Nate replied. I want to swim again. Swim? Harry entreated incredulously. You're a nut, man. It's late. We gotta go home. Swim first, insisted Nate, aggressively grabbing a hold of Harry's wrist. Come on, Harry. Down to the water. Nate? Harry beseeched as he struggled against Nate's vice-like grip in his endeavor to pull his friend into the pond. Oh, look out! My shoes are getting wet! Nate, let go of my arm! This isn't funny! I don't like being out here on our own! On our own? Nate queried. But Harold, we're not on our own. Succeeding the utterance of those foreboding words... Dark figures began to emerge from the pond, illuminated by the muted radiance of the gibbous moon. He could make out greyish-green skin pulled taut over emaciated frames, long sallow arms terminating in slender fingers tipped with vicious talons. 
The sharp points of slightly protuberant ears peeked out from beneath a mess of long, green, slimy strands of kelp-like vegetation that covered their heads. Shimmering green points of light reflected from sunken sockets. Peel back over gleaming fangs as he grinned menacingly. Oh, God! Nate, please! Harry begged. Up above, near the shoreline, a violent splashing shuddered out through the motionless water. She smiled, knowing that her offspring would not go hungry. As they led her out into the birthing place, her eyes grew bright and clear. He stood alone, waiting for her, so still, so silent, so impossibly calm. Nate, please, Harry implored desperately as he was tossed belligerently at the feet of the horrors that emerged from the depths. I came back for you. Don't... Harry gargled his final adjurations in vain, trying to petition mercy as he was hauled beneath the tenebrous surface. In the centre of the field, they released her, the momentum carrying her massive body forwards where her lover stood. They met, they touched, and they embraced. Then her great body bucked and heaved, as the burden within was released into the clinging green water. They stood, mute with wonder, at the grace of their convulsions. Her lover jackknifed in the murk above the eggs. A single whiplash of white in the blackness, and it is complete. They had both opened their bodies to the oxygen-bearing water now, the same water that had nearly eradicated their kind thirty-seven years before. Except the ones in the supermarket, in the airtight freezer units. It was just sunset when the flood hit, and not all of them were awake yet. All they had to do was wait until the water stopped running and became still. They didn't need air. It was the same reason they were able to survive in coffins underground. The taint of Nosferatu was anaerobic after all. It was a wonder they had never thought of living underwater centuries ago. They only ever had one true disadvantage, and that was their aversion to the lethal rays of the sun. Any gathering of them attracted the attention of men with stakes to let air into their bodies. That was why there were no organized vampire settlements before. Now, having made the final sacrifice, like salmon after spawning, they thrashed weakly decaying even in life. In dying, they were the greatest among them. Linking their hands, they honoured them. They circled around. Faster and faster they spun, a pale white carousel careening through the submarine dark. The lovers were quite disintegrated by then, a suspension of pale flakes in the churning water. But their death had served its function. They did what was required of them. The eggs cast a milky and opalescent light, like the neon tumours of lanternfish. Grey shapes twisted within them. New life, savage and unknowable. The shells bulged and rippled as the fetal blurs inside them spasmed with the joy and agony of existence. A membrane began to tear, and then another. The moment had arrived. It had begun. I had another nightmare last night. Oh? Well, more like a dream. It had a happy ending, so it's not really a nightmare, right? Emma had black eyes. She trained them intently on the older man sitting across from her. He had short, grey, neat hair and deep-cut wrinkles, especially around his lips, jowled cheeks and forehead. His nose seemed to protrude over his top lip. It reminded Emma of a fishing hook, a fleshy fishing hook. The heavy lighting did the man no favours. A dark room, 
the heavy glow of a lone desk lamp brining his every feature, every item around them. No dust greeted the furniture, no swimming in the gleam of the light. When silence entered that room, it seemed to permeate one's mind and senses. But he was pleasant to talk to. How was it different from the others? His voice was low, like it was dragging across gravel to get to her. I told you, it had a happy ending. He nodded. Would you like to start from the beginning, then? Emma stared back. It was a tree, alone in an endless plain of grass. It had been alone for fourteen years, except for a very large giraffe. The tree didn't know how old the giraffe was, but it had always been there, for as long as the tree could remember. The man raised an eyebrow, jotting something down on his notepad. The scratch of his pen irked Emma. It always did. An acacia again? After raising her head once in confirmation, she continued. One day, the giraffe started eating off of the tree. It hurt. The tree felt the crushing bite, resounding rip and hurtful crunch each time the giraffe decided to feed from it. But the tree was helpless. It was a tree. All it could do was stay there, stuck in place until it was over. Eventually, the giraffe would become full and leave. When the man only continued to scribble away, she continued. And the tree would be left half-maimed and begin to heal. And healing was slow and scary. And why is that? The heavily shadowed man had stopped taking notes, pointing his beak-like nose right at her. His brusque eyebrows conveyed intensity, the urgency and importance of her answer. Paramount. But his brown eyes glinted with want of understanding. Because, she explained, unfazed by the fervor of his stare, it was terrified that the giraffe would come back. And, he inquired, putting his pen and paper aside and leaning forward, did it? Emma nodded distantly. Yes, it always came back. Just when the tree thought it would be able to finish healing, just when it started to hope that it was all over, the giraffe would come back hungrier every time. Each time, the tree regrew as best it could, but it was never good enough. The giraffe came back for more and more. It liked the taste of acacia, you know, reveled in it, and the tree was getting desperate. She didn't notice the stinging wetness of her eyes, her curled posture, or the earnesty in her voice. But the man did. One time, the giraffe ate and ate and ate for hours. The tree cried and screamed, but couldn't run away. So, it resigned itself. It was almost gone. Barely anything left for the giraffe to eat. But the tree didn't care anymore. At least, if it died, the cycle would end, it thought. But the giraffe left it. No more than a twig in a vast field next to the towering monster that had just been consuming it. As the giraffe walked away, the tree realized that it had survived and began to grow again. Emma took a breath, composing herself and steadying her tone. She measured her inhales and exhales. The room seemed to cool down as she reined in her emotions. What did the tree do next? The gruff voice asked. Returning her attention to the other party, she started again, slower this time, carefully distancing herself from her words now. It knew it wouldn't survive the giraffe next time. It didn't have enough time to grow back. But it knew the giraffe was going to come. It always came, and the hope that it wouldn't had slithered away like the snake it was. So the tree found some ants. It knew the ants, and knew how dangerous they were, and it collected all the ants that it could. It put them on its only surviving branch and waited, not even bothering to heal itself. And when the giraffe came back, she shrugged. It ate like it always did, but in its haste to devour, to taste, 
it didn't notice the ants. And as it took the branch, so too it took the ants. Every last one. They were poisonous, and the tree knew that. So it wasn't surprised when the giraffe fell down, or when the massive beast stopped breathing. The tree was left with two tiny green leaves underneath the sun, and it knew now that it could finally heal and grow, and finally survive without the constant fear of the giraffe. But it did take more ants and place them on its branches, just in case another giraffe ever found it. There was a stretch of silence seeping about. Emma sat with her hands in her lap. Emma, he finally started, clearing his throat. Should I be worried? She pondered this for a moment, then looked him straight in the eye and shook her head. <laughs> no. One hour was up, and she left the child psychologist's office, promising she'd see him next week. She always did feel lighter after their sessions, though this time, perhaps, it had been her dream. As the sun set, she unlocked the front door to her house, not bothering to announce her arrival. The building was bleak and gloomy, dark, just like her psychologist's office. Except it was dusty, very dusty. The stuff was ubiquitous all over the furniture, in the air, highlighting the last rays of sunlight at the day's end. She looked over and saw her father asleep on the couch, neck crooked up, mouth agape, and a nearly empty bottle in his hand. He snored. She smiled and grabbed a knife from the kitchen. So, two stories for you tonight from Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read all your stories that you sent to me directly. And, well, a couple of good ones there. You didn't think that first one was going to be a vampire story, did you? Yeah, it kind of snuck up on you at the end there. Did me, certainly. I had no idea where that was going when I started reading it. And the second one, well, what a troubled little girl she is. Anyway... Try and give that game a chance. Uh, I've been playing it quite a lot. Not very good, but I'm getting there slowly. Really enjoying it. And, well, you know, keeping me off the streets, keeping me out of trouble. <laughs> well, that's it for another week. But, of course, I will be back with you on Monday. Oh, hang on. No, I've got my Sunday series coming, haven't I? The Vigilante stories. Yes, they will continue on Sunday. So, don't be surprised. Be ready for a special story on Sunday evening. Well, that's enough for me for one night, isn't it? Sweet dreams, and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience... And come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store. Pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, looking forward to seeing you all again real soon. So, come check me out, okay? <laughs>